Welcome to Sunspots, where we explore the many ways that the Holy Spirit is working in the people, places, ministries, and missions on the surface of the sun, that is, the Synod of the Sun. I'm Thomas Riggs, Communication and Administration Coordinator for the Synod. Through the interviews, stories, conversations, and information of this podcast, our prayer is that you find inspiration, community, and connection in the sun. Let's get started. Also, please note that you can find the documentation referenced in this Liminal Space episode on our website. Go to synodsun.org and click on blog. Welcome to uh, this version of Living in Liminal Space. Uh, just to refresh, liminal space is that time between what was and what is. And we've been exploring what that might look like in the church in different dimensions. Today, we are shifting focus a little bit from the church um, to the broader world context. And we will be uh, having uh, an engagement today regarding uh, the situation in Israel-Palestine. Uh, even as we uh, talk today. And so uh, we're talking about what was and what is the hope and the dream for the future uh, of that uh, holy space, especially during this holy week that we record. This morning, uh, our uh, guest is really no guest to me. Uh, We have known each other for my whole life to our whole lifetime and he is my identical twin brother ron uh ron uh has been engaged with uh the israel palestine uh issues for the past 20 years uh in the pc usa and um now is still very active uh in uh leading groups um to israel palestine and so Ron, it's a joy to have you with us today. Why don't you tell a little bit more about what you'd like to say about yourself? Thank you, Steve. Um, So my first trip to um, Israel and to Palestine was in 2006. I went with a group from Columbia Theological Seminary, and we were basically told that this was going to be a spiritual pilgrimage. We would not talk about the geopolitical realities on the ground at all. But you can't go to that land uh, with open eyes and not begin asking questions about what's going on, um, particularly when you see a um, uh, a 30 foot uh, barrier right down the middle of a village. Um, so I came back and I began reading and studying. And the next year, um, actually in 2008, I was elected to be a commissioner to General Assembly in San Jose. And as you know, your computer matched to a committee, and my committee was the International Relations Committee. And the major topic that we really dealt with that year was the Israel-Palestine conflict. As a result of my involvement with that committee, I was asked by the moderator at the time, Bruce Race Chow, if I would um, be the um, chair of a Middle East study committee that was to study and report back to uh, General Assembly in 2010. And so our very diverse committee uh, traveled throughout the Middle East, to Lebanon, to Syria, to Jordan, to Palestine, to Israel, and we presented our report. Since that time, I have continued to be involved and have traveled um, to that land at least once a year, often taking uh, a group with me uh, for not only uh, to see the holy sites, but to meet the people of the land and to hear their stories of what's going on um, there um, in that territory. It was after the Gaza War, uh, October the 7th, broke out um, that several of us, uh, I'm God Biblawi, who used to be our Middle East coordinator for the Middle East and for Europe, uh, and Susan Wilder and I pulled together a national grassroots Presbyterian delegation of 35 people. Um, And we traveled um, to uh, Israel and to Palestine um, really to interact with our partners there uh, and to express solidarity with them in the midst of the suffering um, that they are currently undergoing. And it's um, out of that experience that I really would like to talk with you today. Ron, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, We won't have any shy jokes today. 
uh, but um, uh, we'll, we will try to bring uh, truly a presence with us today. So, Ron, we've just got a series of questions for you. Um, one, what what was the context out of which October 7th occurred? As, and as succinctly as you can describe for us, uh, the pre-October uh, 7th situation in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. What was life like? Well, thank you, Steve. Um, as a, before I began answering that question, I think first we need to realize that October the 7th was not the beginning of the first Gaza war. Um, there was a Gaza war in 2008 and 2009 that lasted for 23 days. There was another one in 2012 that lasted for eight days. There was one that started in 2014 that lasted for 15 days. There was one in 2021 that lasted for 11 days. Um, so this was this is not an isolated event. I think we need to note that up front. Um, we also need to note, though, that this conflict that we're talking about is not a religious conflict. It is not a war between Muslims and Jews. This is a political conflict. Um, and we also need to stop and realize, I often hear it said, oh, that's just a 2,000-year-old conflict. It's not a 2,000-year-old conflict. Secular nationalistic Zionism is a 19th century European political movement. And this conflict did not start until the 20th century. We look back at the history of this land that we call Palestine. Um, and for 600 years, the Ottoman Empire ruled this land. And for 600 years, Jews, Muslims, and Christians lived side by side in peace with one another, recognizing and respecting one another. The early conflict really started with the forming of Zionism in Europe, late 19th century. Um, Theodore Herzl, designing and Zionism, wanted to find a homeland or a Jewish, a place for a Jewish state. They looked at South America, they looked at Africa, and finally they settled on the land of Palestine. Well, at the end of World War I, when the Ottoman Empire sided with Germany, they lost control of that land. And Europeans, the German and the French, decided we're going to break up this land of the Ottoman Empire and we're going to form two mandates. One we're going to call the French Mandate. It's currently Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And we're going to have the British Mandate. It's the land that we now call Palestine, Israel, and Jordan. Um, and these two mandates started, and the Brits were ruling this land um, from the end of World War I. Um, and at that time, because of Theodore Herzl and because of the Brits making a promise to the Zionists that we're going to create this homeland for Jews, we had a mass migration of Jews now to the land that we call Palestine. And that's when the tensions began to develop. Well, everything uh, was not fine during this time. In fact, there were a number of Jewish terrorist groups that wanted to throw the Brits out. They wanted to end the British mandate. They wanted to rule the land themselves. You may have heard of the bombing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. They wanted the Brits out. And finally, at the end of World War II, um, the um, the Brits threw up their hands and they said, no more of this. We don't want anything to do with it. And the UN had just been formed in 1945. And they said, UN, it's your problem. And so one of the first things that the UN did without anybody in the Middle East was they came up with the UN partition plan. And the UN, 55% of the Palestinian land to the Jews who only controlled 5% of the land, they were 35% of the population. 55% of the land goes to 5% or 35% of the population. And here the Palestinians, who the land was all theirs before, now gets 45%. Well, immediately the Zionists say, that's great. And they immediately form their own state. But the Arabs said, that's not fair. And a war breaks out. And the war from 1947 to 1949 is called by the Jews or by Israelis, the, their war of independence. To the Palestinians, it's called the Nakba. It is called the great catastrophe. 
And during that war, 750,000 Palestinians are driven from their land. Um, and the Zionists then claim 78% of the land, only 22% now belong to the Palestinians. And what we have at that point is the beginning of the last colonial project in the world. At the formation of the UN, most of the world was giving up colonialism. But this was the beginning of settler colonialism, where you take settlers and occupy and claim a land that once belonged to someone else. The popular slogan back then was, this is a land with no people for a people with no land. One of the biggest lies ever put forth in the world. This was a land that was occupied by Palestinian people. So um, that uh, continued um, really until 1967. And in 1967, most of us were alive. Well, many of us were alive then. Um, and we call that the Six-Day War. And during the Six-Day War, Israel occupies all of Palestine, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, uh, East Jerusalem, along with the Golan Heights that belong to Syria and the Sinai Peninsula that belong to Egypt. At that time, we also have the birth of the settler movement. And we've all heard about settlements but what are settlements? Settlements are where you take people um, from your land and put them into the occupied territory. And according to the Fourth Geneva Convention, Article 49, an occupying power cannot take, transport, or deport part of its own civilian population and put them into the occupied territory. It would be much like when we occupied Iraq the U.S. occupied Iraq. If we had taken people from South Carolina and said, we're going to take 100,000 people and put them now in Iraq and create a little U.S. colony there, that's illegal according to international law. But the settler, colonial, uh, settler colonialists were not satisfied with 78% of the land. They wanted more. And so they built all these settlements now in the West Bank. And as of January of this year, there are currently 144 illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, including 11 in East Jerusalem. Um, there are almost 700,000 illegal settlers living in the in an occupied territory. Now these settlements completely surround Bethlehem, and the only way in and out if you're a Palestinian is to go through a checkpoint, and you have to often have a permit to get through. Settler colonialism is what we're talking about pre-October 7th and even continuing today. But the thing about this settler colonialism and its occupation is it's dehumanizing to Palestinian people. The unemployment rate in Israel prior to October the 7th was 5%. For Palestinians in the West Bank, 17%. But listen to this. Living in Gaza, the unemployment rate was 42%. 42%. Now, Palestinians living in Gaza, it's only 25 miles wide, long, three and a half to seven and a half miles wide at the uh, wide is 0 .7 and a half miles wide, and 2.3 million people live there. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out without Israel's permission. It was dehumanizing. Colin McCain is a writer who's written a wonderful book entitled The Paragon, um, and in the book it describes a relationship between a Palestinian and an Israeli Jew who have both lost children in this uh, conflict. And Bassem Aramin, who's a Palestinian, describes the occupation this way. He didn't hate Jews. He didn't hate Israel. What he hated was being occupied, the humiliation of it, the strangulation, the daily degradation, the abasement. Try a checkpoint just for one day. Try a wall down the middle of your schoolyard. Try your olive trees ripped up by a bulldozer. Try your food rotting in a truck at a checkpoint. Try the occupation of your imagination. The thing about the occupation was that it never let you decide. It took away your ability for choice. Mm. Um, and this settler colonialism and its dehumanizing effects, that's the context 
out of which 10-7 occurs. Wow. Thank you. Insightful. What occurred on October 7th, 7th and what has occurred in Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem since October 7th? What is life like now in both Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories? Well, the first thing I'll say is that if we're ever going to really talk about this issue and get anywhere, we've got to begin with truth telling. And truth telling has not been taking place in U.S. media with regard to this issue. Right up front, I think we do need to acknowledge uh, that the death toll on October 7th by Israelis, by, excuse me, two Israelis by Hamas stands at 1,145 people. Of these, 250 were IDF soldiers, 53 were police or security force people, 63 were armed civilian security guards, and 782 were unarmed civilians. We do know that on that day, the 247 hostages were taken. Israel believes that today, 99 people are still being held in Gaza as hostages, along with the bodies of 31 dead hostages. Right up front, we need to acknowledge that October 7th, barbaric and some of was barbaric, and some of Hamas's actions were crimes against humanity. But if Hamas had only attacked military targets, it would not have been against humanitarian law. It would have been simply an act of resisting the occupation, um, and we need to call it for what it is. But what we what we really don't know, most people in the West don't know, is what's been taking place in Gaza. Um, as of today, uh, 32,000 Palestinians have been killed. Over 72,000 have been wounded since the start of the war, and 70% of those are women and children. There are roughly 10,000 that are missing and assumed to be dead. The tragic thing is that in the first two weeks of the war, roughly 90% of the munitions that Israel dropped in Gaza were satellite guided bombs weighing 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. And according to US military officials, in all of our fighting in Iraq and Iran, we were concerned with using over a 500 pound bomb. But here Israel was using in this densely populated area, 1,000 and 2,000 pound bombs. If a ceasefire was to occur today, the projected additional death toll due to malnutrition and disease would be an additional seven to 12,000 people. If the invasion in Rafa occurs in southern Gaza, the projected death toll of Palestinians will be 70,000 people. Half of Gaza's population right now, 1.1 million people, are crammed into Rafa, a town that originally had 250,000 people. And the UN reports this, quote, their living conditions are abysmal. They lack the basic necessity to survive, stalked by hunger, disease, and death. In its latest situation report dated March the 1st, the UN Agency of Palestinian Refugees, that is UNRWA, um, said that uh, on average, only 97 trucks were getting a day for humanitarian aid during February. Mm -hmm. That's down from 150 um, in January and well short of the 500 that are needed to sustain life. Mm -hmm. Why the shortage? simply because Israel, I think, wants to starve the Palestinian people. They're approaching genocide. There's a new acronym that takes place. It's being used in all of the Palestinian hospitals now, WCNSF. And the acronym simply means wounded child, no surviving family. Many parents at bedtime are writing the names of a child on their arm and their leg. So if the house is bombed in the middle of the night and they're killed, that someone will be able to identify their child. Wow. Gaza is now the deadliest place in the world for a journalist. 
More than 75% of the journalists killed worldwide in 2023 died during the first two weeks of Israel's assault on Gaza. In the West Bank today, Israel's jailing of Palestinian journals has reached an all-time high, tying Iran. Parts of all of Gaza's 12 universities have been bombed and destroyed. 378 schools have been destroyed, 231 teachers, 95 professors have been killed. Numerous libraries, archives, museums have been destroyed, damaged, and plundered. IDF soldiers have been filled carrying things out of the museum. Why? Because I think it's an attempt to destroy Palestinian culture. One half of all Palestinian homes have now been destroyed. And we need to wake up and realize our own complicity. The U.S. gives $3.8 billion a year for military aid to Israel. And currently in Congress now, there's a bill for another $17 billion in new military assistance to Israel. Yet at the same time, the U UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency, we had an opportunity to meet with Adam Bulotsky, who was a director of UNRWA Affairs in the West. UNRWA oversees 19 refugee camps, 900,000 people, 96 schools, 45 health centers. But in January, Israel gave unsubstantiated claims that some of the UNRWA's 30,000 workers were involved in October 7th. And so the U.S. led a response with 16 other nations freezing UNRWA funding. Hmm. When we met with Adam, he said this, this that we're witnessing today in Gaza, this is a humanitarian crisis like the UN has never seen before. And Adam has served in the Sudan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Ethiopia. He concluded by saying, this is the blatant massacre of a civilian population. The International Court of Justice says this is plausible genocide. That's what's happening in Gaza. And I wish nothing else was happening in the West Bank or East Jerusalem. Mm. But one day we had the opportunity of going to the Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. We met with uh, Nada Anasar. He's head of the Palestinian Prisoner Society. And along with him, he brought five women whose husbands or sons are in administrative detention. Now, since October the 7th, more than 7,000 Palestinians, including 400 children in the West Bank, have been detained in administrative detention. And their only crime, not that they've committed a crime, their only crime is that they might plan to break the law in the future. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment your family asleep in the middle of the night, being awakened by the sound of a loud pounding at the door, accompanied by the sound of soldiers demanding to enter. The soldiers move through your house with an automatic weapon, commanding that the parents, you, produce your son or your daughter for interrogation. You begin pleading with the soldiers, but to no avail. You pull your child, barely a teenager, out of bed, he or she is still shaking off sleep. They're blindfolded and they're taken into custody. Now, when a person is taken into custody and administrative detention, neither the family nor the individual is given information about the basis for their detention. Although it's required by law that they appear before a judge within eight days, in almost every case, they're told that the reason for their detention cannot be released because the file's classified. They're not allowed an attorney. The parents can't see the child, and the detention can last for up to six months, but it can be renewed indefinitely. One of the family members present had a husband who's been in administrative detention for 10 years. And she has never been told the basis for his detention. We then heard the stories of mothers with young sons, 13, 14, and 15, that had been detention for months. They haven't heard from them. They haven't seen them. They've not been allowed to visit them. Hmm. Now, when an event takes place like this, 
there's silence in the camp because everyone wonders the next morning, let's discover what child has been taken. Since October the 7th, nine Palestinians have been tortured to death at administrative detention. The Ismaili military is keeping their bodies, refuses to release them for proper burials. And so you know how people now sleep in the refugee camps? Hmm. Men and children go to sleep, not in their pajamas, but in their clothes with their shoes on, so that if they're awoken in the middle of the night and they're taken, they won't be taken in their underwear and pajamas. We had dinner with a group of local nonprofit owners and also tourist shop owners, and we asked them if they'd ever been detained. And every one of them said, well, sure, everyone has been detained. And we said, well, do you know the reason why you were detained? And they said, no, no idea. Our only crime is being Palestinian. In East Jerusalem, we had the opportunity there of going into the Albastan neighborhood, and we met Fakri Abu Diab. His home had been destroyed three days earlier. The military, Israeli military, had shown up early in the morning before the break of dawn, yeah. and they had bulldozed his house with a caterpillar bulldozer. Every Palestinian home in Silwan has received a demolition order from the Israeli government. And these demolition orders can sit for years at a time. And the pretext of these demolition orders is either one, they were built without a permit. Now, if you lived in occupied territory and you apply for a permit, 95% of the Palestinians are not given building permits. And so what are they supposed to do for a place to live? They build a home, illegal according to them, so we can tear it down. Or many of these Palestinians have owned their home and their land going all the way back to the Ottoman Empire, but they don't have proper documentation. So Israel says they can come in and simply destroy the homes. Mm. Approximately 300,000 Palestinians live in East Jerusalem. Since 1947, about 50,000 Palestinian homes have been demolished. But here's the shocking news. While all the world is being paying attention to Gaza since October the 7th, there's been a 70% increase in the of homes in East Jerusalem. My son is a Raleigh attorney. He's currently working for Sibyl Ecumenical Liberation um, Theological Center in East Jerusalem. And several weeks ago, he wrote kind of a sarcastic invitation to his mother to come visit him at East Jerusalem. And here's what he wrote. Welcome to glamorous East Jerusalem, where residents pay 40% of the city's taxes, but only receive 10% of the services. Why is that, you might ask? Because they're brown. Residents in East Jerusalem enjoy a healthy 80% poverty rate and get to enjoy second-class citizenship by being classified as citizens neither of Israel nor Jordan, but as stateless permanent residents of Israel despite the fact that their families have lived here for generations. East Jerusalemites enjoy regular trips to Israeli military prison where they post free Palestine, whenever they post free Palestine or something similar on their Facebook page. And while in prison, they get treated to cold food and daily beatings. So come on out to East Jerusalem where your wildest dreams of injustice come true. Such indeed is the reality um, of um, life currently uh, in East Jerusalem. One of our last nights there, we met with a group of Palestinian um, uh, Christians. They were actually from Gaza. They had gotten out before October the 7th. And as we talked about the, with these five Christians, uh, all of them had loved ones that had been killed uh, in the bombardments of Gaza. And I'm haunted to this day by the question of one of the 20-year-old, she's the daughter of a Palestinian pastor. And she asked us the question, it was simply this, how can Christians in the United States stand by in silence as our people are blown up night after night. How can Christians in the United States stand by in silence as our people are blown up night after night? 
Wow. Ron, um, my ear hurts from having a skin cancer removed, but my heart breaks. Our hearts break. Thank you for your insight, knowledge, passion, and the call to action. What can we do strategically to advocate for a just peace in the land from the river to the sea? But let me give you uh, several uh, things that we can do. Um, as I've said uh, earlier in my presentation, we're complicit. You and I are enabling what's going on in Gaza because of the $3.8 billion that we get annually and because of the $17 billion that we're about to give to Israel. Um, so first, let me urge you to call your elected officials in Washington um, and to demand the following, an immediate permanent ceasefire in the Gaza war. Uh, yes, there's been a UN resolution but it has not been enacted upon. So call for an immediate permanent ceasefire in the Gaza war. Call for unhindered and adequate humanitarian aid to Gaza. That would involve refunding UNRWA um, and the support of humanitarian aid in Gaza. Three, ask for the release of all Israeli and Palestinian prisoners of war. Four, and I think this is very important, ask for the withholding of all US military aid to Israel until the above conditions are met. We have the power to make some of these things happen. And what we have to do is withhold military aid. And without US military aid, the Gaza war will come to an end. So let me urge you to call the White House. Um, I've listed here the number to the White House. Call Joe Biden. Tell Joe Biden what you feel. Call twice a week. You need to call during business hours but also call your U.S. senators and your House of Representatives um, in Washington. There's a switchboard number there. They can connect you with your senator. They can connect you with your, your representative. That's one thing you can do. Um, the other, let me urge you as Presbyterians, uh, join and support the work of the Israel-Palestine Mission Network. This is a mandated mission network of the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, we just had our annual meeting, but there's opportunities for you to use their website, participate um, in their webinars, and to remain um, knowledgeable of what's going on. The other is, I would say, get involved locally with political advocacy. Uh, FOSNIA, that is the Friends of Seville North America, and I've got a, a link to their website. Uh, they're conducting a number of rallies and marches in various cities uh, throughout the U.S., so there are many ways for you to uh, get involved. Thank you, Ron. Um, what are resources people can use to learn more about the events of October 7th and the ongoing Gaza war? To you, I have listed um, three books that kind of give a, a gentle introduction um, and I think are very readable. Um, the one piece that I would really urge you to look at um, is it's an Al Jazeera piece that's on YouTube. You say Al Jazeera. Well, let me explain. Um, the U.S. has basically lost our role as a mediator in the Middle East. If you've read in the news, who, who are the mediators uh, in this conflict now? Qatar is the country that really has become the mediator between the Palestinians and between the Israelis. And Al Jazeera is owned and run by Qatar. So they're a mediating force. They're an accurate, truth-telling news source. And they've produced a one hour, I know it's one hour, but it's well worth your time. It's entitled October 7th, Al Jazeera Investigation. And it's on YouTube. And I highly recommend it. Um, you, you'll come away completely understanding October the 7th a little differently. There are many other resources that are listed there from uh, live news sources to daily uh, news feeds. Um, Haaretz, who is the New York Times of Jerusalem, uh, is an excellent source. They have a, uh, a daily um, little email they send out on what's going on. There's another group called Churches for Middle East Peace. It is a, a group, it is a group based in Washington 
of 30 different denominations of which the Presbyterian Church USA is a part of. And I strongly recommend CMAP, Churches for Middle East Peace, as a way for you to stay informed. Um, there's a lot of information, but you need to make sure that you read beyond Western press. More than anything else, um, I, I would really encourage you to, um, to get involved. Um, St. Augustine said that hope has two beautiful daughters, and the two beautiful daughters of hope are anger and courage. Anger at what is taking place and courage to make a difference. And I hope indeed that you will be angry, and I hope that you'll be courageous, stay informed, and get involved. Ron, thank you so much. Uh, for being with us today. Uh, let us close with a prayer uh, as we end this time together. God of peace and justice, uh, God whose love we uh, follow and emulate this week, help us to be angry at what's occurring but to have hearts of courage that march on to the way of love and peace and justice. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel and Palestine. Hear our prayers, O oh God, through the Christ we pray. Amen. Ron, again, thank you. Thank you, Steve. In the Synod of the Sun, we believe when we work together across boundaries, we make visible the good news and find wholeness as the body of Christ. In our common calling, we impact lives together. So let's remember to connect with, equip, and empower one another in the name of Jesus Christ, today and every day.